my name is Deborah Kitko. I am the genealogy librarian here at the Wayne County Public Library. And in one of my previous videos, I had mentioned a story about my great-great-grandfather, Orson Sheldon Reed. Um, to recap briefly, my grandmother had believed for all of her life that her grandfather was an only child. His mom had died at a young age, and he went to live with his grandparents, and they finished raising him. This is a story of how this oral tale was partially disproven. Orison Sheldon Reed, debunking an oral story. Much of my audience may remember the old game that we used to call telephone, where one person would you'd actually line up a group of people, and you start at one end, and someone would whisper something in the, the next person's ear, and then that next person person would whisper something in the next person's ear and on down through the line and you got to the end person and you discover and then the end person would actually have to repeat what the story was and then the majority of the time what the what the final story was was nothing near to what the first part what the original story was that's very similar to family stories they're passed down from generation to generation and often they become what people consider like a big fish story. So it starts out small, and then each time it's told, it just gets bigger and bigger as you, know, as you want to sort of just explode and just sort of really expand on the drama of the whole story. So family stories, they have the tendency to change over time. Sometimes it just, it just happens accidentally, other times, it may actually be done on purpose to either just over-dramatize a fact or to um, just to actually change what was really going on to make it sound more, to sound better. Sometimes the details are not remembered clearly. Sometimes someone may just overhear something and they've jumped to conclusions or they've mis completely misunderstood what was actually being told. And I know I'm not by myself on this one. I know... And if anyone who did this has probably at some point overheard something and misunderstood it completely, and then if you're not careful, you begin telling the story the way you understood it, and before you know it, you've actually started the, go the, um, the gossip meal. Such is the case with the story of my grandmother um, involving her grandpa Reed. The story she told to us as kids growing up many times. As you recall, Grandpa, according to what my grandmother had said, Grandpa Reed was an only child. She really believed that his mother had died when Grandpa was just a young, young lad, and that Grandpa Reed went to live with his grandparents shortly after his mother had died, and then his, his grandparents finished raising him to adulthood. I'd have no reason to think that there was no issue with the family story because I mean grandma was not one for telling big fish stories and she was pretty accurate in terms of remembering details of like names dates and places she may be off a year sometimes with the death date or, or birthday but she was actually pretty accurate considering how much information was in her mind and how much she had recalled just from um, her memory oftentimes though when you are actually looking at a family story you realize that the family story itself may only reveal just a nugget of truth. Um, and that's what we're going to explore here through the next few slides. Anytime you hear a family story or you see a compiled genealogy online, you actually are wanting to verify this information. Uh, this information is usually secondhand, and you really want to try to pinpoint the original documents that either support the story or that may actually have a different storyline with it. Whenever you're starting to research, you want to start with what you know and look to the unknown. This is the same way if you're um, trying to verify an actual family story or to disprove it in some cases. In the case of Orson Sheldon Reed, his death certificate indicated that he died on September 10th of 1938 there in Lawrence Township, Washington County, Ohio. As you're going through the process, you'll want to take a look and analyze the documents that you look at. 
For example, on a death certificate, this includes both primary as well as secondary information. Primary information meaning that it was actually recorded at or near the time of death. It usually involved an eyewitness to the account. Secondary information would be that information that's recorded at a much later date, and it's usually told by a person who is not an eyewitness to the, to the event. In this particular case of a death certificate, we're assuming that the primary information is that Orson Sheldon Reed did die in Lawrence Township, Washington County, Ohio, and that his death date was September 10th of 1938. Um, that was actually done at the time of his death, so you would actually think it's pretty accurate. The secondary information is what I have shown here in red. This is information that may or may not be right, and it depends on the informant and how informed that individual was. So, you know, the individual giving this information would not have been born, or would not have been living at the time that Orison was actually born. So the birth date given as June 23rd, 1840, would be considered secondary information. Likewise, the informant is indicating that he was born in Chester, Pennsylvania, and it gives his parents' names as Robert Reed and Mary Barnes, both of which were born in New Jersey. This information could be correct or it may not be, but as part of the whole process, you want to make sure that you're actually analyzing the document and determining what may or may not be true and try to verify the information provided within this document with other sources so you can actually correct, um, collect them and, and compare them. So basically, as a, as a cap, your primary information is first-hand information. It's usually recorded at or near the time of the event. Secondary information is second-hand information. And that actually, that information is dependent on how informed the informant would have been. It is usually recorded much later than the time of the event. And usually, it's recorded by someone who is not present. And to save on time, because we've done other case studies, looking at census records, etc., Here's just a summary of Orson Sheldon Reed and his adult life. Um, starting with uh, when he enlisted in the Civil War um, on August 15, 1862, this indicates that he was age 22 at the time of his enlistment, which puts his age about 1840. Now, the actual roster does not include where he was born. We'd have to do other information to try to verify this information. If you look at the 1870 census, which was taken August 26, 1870, this one is a little bit different than most of the others. This one indicates he's age 27, so he would have been born about 1843, and this one gives his place of birth as Ohio. In each of the other records, in 1880, 1900, 1910, 1920, clear through onto his actual death certificate, it indicates that he was born about 1840 to 1841, 1920, it does give his age maybe 78, born about 1842. So you have a discrepancies here. Usually when you're going through, you want to try to find a record that is closest to the time of the event. So in this case, you're going to want to go back to a couple other census records and see. If you look at the 1860 census, we know from the death certificate that his father was Robert Reed and his mom was listed as Mary Barnes. In the 1860 census, we find that they that Orson Reed is listed as age 19, so it gives his birth date as about 1841. And likewise, this is given his birthplace as Ohio. Um, he is residing there in Seneca Township in Monroe, Monroe County, Ohio in 1860. And of course, any of the census records prior to 1880, you have an inferred relationship. So it does not specifically say that, you know, Orson is the son of Robert or that, you know, Mariah is his mom or a stepmom. It doesn't give relationships that way. But you'll notice here in 1860 census that um, this is the latest census that he would be with his parents or his inferred parents. So in this case, they're given as Robert and Mariah. But you notice that he has an older sibling, Royal, and then there's a host of other siblings much younger than Orison. So just from this census record and doing other research to verify that these were indeed the biological brothers or, and sisters of Orson, or in some cases maybe a half-sibling, we discovered that um, Orson was indeed not an only child. 
But just to make sure, let's go back to one other, to a previous census in 1850. 1850, once again, is given his birth year is about 1843. He's born, he's age seven years old. You have Robert, who's age 37, as the inferred father, and then you have a Lucinda, Reed, who's age 28. Well, that still doesn't match the mother's name that's given in a death certificate, because remember, the death certificate indicated Mary. In 1860, we have Mariah, which could be a variation of Mary, and then you have 1850, which says Lucinda. So we have some conflicts that we have to resolve here. But he is still residing in Seneca, Monroe County, Ohio, and this census, like the majority of other census records, are indicating that his birthplace is Pennsylvania. So I'm, I'm guessing that although two, at least two of the sources indicate he's born in Ohio, I'm going to have the tendency to believe that he was more or less born in Pennsylvania, possibly Chester, Pennsylvania, but I have to do further research to try to verify that information. But this one you'll see that he has two older brothers, um, Royal and Morris in this case, where in 1860 it was Morris, and they had the, two, the ages goofed up there. And then you have three younger siblings. You have a Francis, a Prudence, and a Phila. So at this point, just based on these records, the family story we would think initially would be debunked. However, have we really done a recently exhaustive search to, to say that this family story handed down to my grandmother, handed down to us grandkids, is actually true? We can establish that Orson was not an only child, but we actually want to try to get to what the real story is, you know, what really took place. Did my, mother, did my grandmother misunderstand something? Did she overhear something? Sometimes we may never know the true story. But if you look at the documents, we'll take a look here that we find a record that Robert Reed was married to Lucinda Barnes on July 1st, 1838 in Portage County, Ohio. Um, there's an application made for the marriage record on the 29th of June, 1838. So, um, so at least a Lucinda, which is probably Lucinda, um, would go along with what the 1850 census is indicating in terms of who the mother could be. Now, Monroe County, Ohio is one of the legitimate born counties in Ohio, and so very few records exist um, due to the courthouse burnings. However, also keep in mind that vital records were not kept in Ohio until 1867. There were a few exceptions. So I, you know, with Orson being born sometime between 1840 and 1843, I don't have vital records to go to. And I have not located a church record to find a baptism or anything like that to help verify that information. So where do I turn to try to make sense of this story that's been handed down? Newspapers. The newspapers were not kept at the courthouse and did not experience the fate of a lot of the many other records there in Monroe County. Here in our department, we do have a series um, compiled by Catherine F. Fedorchik, and these are of Monroe County, Ohio genealogical records. In volume four on page 76, there was a, an abstract from the November 15, 1854 newspaper. Died on Saturday morning, the 21st alt, which means last, Mrs. Lucinda Reed, consort of Mr. Robert Reed of Seneca Township, aged 35 years, five months. She was a member of the Presbyterian Church. So this little abstract now has given me the death date for Lucinda Reed, who was the wife of Robert Reed of Seneca Township, so it's the right husband, the right area, about the right age. We also have a church affiliation, so I need to follow through and see if there's any type of Presbyterian church records. So this does verify that Orson's mom did die when Orson was was young. Um, and then in volume three of page 49 of the same series, in a newspaper entry from April 11, 1855, married on the fourth instant Robert Reed and Mariah Reynolds. So this actually, between these two newspaper articles, we now know that Robert lost his first wife and he remarried, and the second wife, Maria, is the one who's listed in the 1860 census. 
So let's uh, recap and take a look at the timeline of Orson Reed. We know that Robert Reed was married to Lucinda, or Lucinda Barnes on July 1st, 1838 in Portage County, Ohio. Their first child, Royal, was born in 1839. Their second child, Morris, or Horace, depending on the record, was born in 1841 in Pennsylvania. Then Orison Reed, the third child, was born in 1843 in Pennsylvania. At least three more children were born to Robert and Lucinda Barnes between 1845 and 1850, all from the census records indicating they were born in Ohio. We know that Lucinda Barnes Reed died Saturday, October 21st, 1854. Orson would have been about 11 years old at the time of his mother's death, and this is using the 1843 birth date, um, approximate birth date that we find in at least two of the census records. And less than six months later, Orson's father remarries. Uh, Robert Reed marries Mariah Reynolds on April 4th, 1855. Robert Reed, with his second wife Maria, actually have at least six more children. William, Lydia A., James R., Sophrona A., Pernell D., and George H. Reed. And by the 1880 census, Robert and Maria Reed and their children have moved to Tyler County, West Virginia. Looking at the records, many of Robert's children from his first marriage remained in Ohio, where the children from the second marriage end up settling in West Virginia. So this could also play a part in why my grandmother didn't have a, a clear recollection of uh, the, the family in, in question here. Now, there is a possibility that Orson may have stayed with his grandparents for a period of time following his mother's death and following his father's second marriage. Maybe he didn't get along with his stepmom. Maybe there's issues with the father. Maybe, you know, the grandparents needed some help. This is information that we do not have privy to any documentation of, so at this point it's just all speculation. And keep in mind that a lot can happen within 10 years. Uh, a lot of stuff that's not recorded. So in summary, family stories are great for providing clues to your family. Information handed down orally needs to be verified whenever possible. And sometimes only a nugget of truth has survived years of the telltaling. So as you're looking at compiled genealogy online, whether it's through family search, ancestry, her my heritage, any of the other resources, just keep in mind that the family stories are great, the compiled genealogies are great, but you still have to do your due diligence in terms of researching. When I did the research and partially disproved the family story, my grandmother was still living. I was only a few years into my professional career and was so excited about my find. I thought Grandma would be excited too. After all, she is one of the key people in my life who had a significant influence on who I am today, including my passion for genealogy. She, loved, she shared a love for family history. Considering she was the youngest of 20 kids, her recollection of names, dates, events was just outstanding. So I had no reason to doubt any of the information that she had told in her stories. Unfortunately, in my excitement, I did not think of the consequences of sharing my newfound information. There are two main principles I would like, for, like to leave you with. Family stories are awesome. They add character to your research, and family stories have the tendency to bring your ancestors to life. However, be careful. When you set out to verify the story, or in some cases, when you, to dis, when you choose to disprove a family legend, you may discover more than what you actually bargained for. When the individual who told the story is still living, think twice on how you should share your results, especially if the evidence debunks the tale or strays a little bit from what has been shared or previously known and believed. When I told what I deemed to be exhilarating news to my research, in my research to Grandma, she became very distraught, and this was much to my surprise. She could not understand why through all her years, her family would have lied to her about Grandpa being an only child. Grandma just shook her head, and she just had that empty stare, just staring off in the distance. And her only remark, why? Why did they lie to me? Why? She truly believed what she remembered was factual and that her family was lied to, had, had lied to her through her years. When talking with other cousins, though, no one else had ever recalled this memory or recalled this story that was actually handed down. 
This leads me to my second main principle, a principle that goes beyond family history, a principle that, that you can actually apply to everyday life. When you hear or read something, decipher its meaning according to your personal worldview, honestly believe what you hear or read is true and recount the same information over and over again, whether you replay the events in your mind or if you vocalize them, you will actually come to believe your own thoughts and stories as fact, regardless if it is true or not true. Before accepting anything you hear or read in truth, that's truth with a small t, even for what you consider to be reliable sources, do your own due diligence. Research the subject thoroughly. Use independent resources. For example, if you find the same information listed in five different resources or printed or recounted in five different means, are these really five different sources or are they still the one, the same source? And the question is, where did that original information came, come from? If they all stem from the same individual or from the same news, then that then those five different sources that recount the same story would only be considered one source. So you want to sort of expand your horizons. Search in more commonly used um, resources as well as the less common, commonly used resources. You may find a unique resource to yourself or to others to actually use. You want to make sure you do a reasonably exhaustive search. Um, you want to analyze and you want to correlate the collected information. Resolve any conflicts that may be evident. And draw a, cl a conclusion that is soundly, reasonably coherent. And remember, as new evidence is revealed, analyzed, and correlated with what has already been established, your original conclusion may change or stay in solid through time. So this is Deb, Ke Deb Kitko, genealogy librarian, signing off.